this week on Hermitcraft. Uh, I, I Whoa! Welcome to the Hermitcraft Recap, my name is Pixel Riffs, our writer is Loy XP, and the Hermits aren't the only ones who've been observing the lunar activity with concern and interest. The community has been buzzing with theories about the expansion of the moon in the Hermitcraft sky, with the obvious conclusion being that it has something to do with the transition to Minecraft 1.18. But obvious conclusions aren't always as fun as theory crafting, so before we get into the events and mishaps, here are some of our favourite suspicions. The Majora's Mask comments have been rolling in since our first episode on the subject, and while the moon doesn't have a face, in one of Mumbo's videos it did appear to have a moustache. We're pretty sure those were clouds, but the worst case scenario is that Iskel has got up there with some black concrete. Given that Doc M and Rendog have been investigating the mysteries of the Hermatrix so far this season, it's possible the moon is changing as part of the parameters of a simulation they're all trapped in, which leads us to wonder if it's really the moon at all and not some sort of astral projection. The different shapes of the moon in various Hermit's videos might also be significant. While most observe it as the flat square it's always been, just, you know, bigger, XB Crafted and iJevin see a round moon in their sky, and Azumavoid sees it as an actual cube with one corner pointed menacingly at the ground. So perhaps the moon is more polyhedral than we initially thought, and it's just rotating to its next cycle. Also, the moon seems to be getting bigger, but has anyone ruled out that the world might just be getting smaller? A full conclusion cannot be drawn because the growing of the moon is a fairly recent event. The community has gone back through earlier videos and caught on that it only started a month or so ago, seemingly without anything triggering the process, which in itself could be a clue because remember, thanks to one Grian, time travel is canon. So maybe the events preceding the moon's landing haven't even happened yet. But really, it's anyone's guess. We're just putting these out there so that if one happens to be correct, we get bragging points. Drop your favourite theories in the comments, and in the meantime, we'll look at all the events and mishaps that occurred on the Hermitcraft server this week. Starting with Wells Knight, who welcomes the end of the server, but in a more geographic sense. In a pleasant bit of housekeeping, Wells dedicates this week's video to cleaning up, clearing out, then completely replacing the end portal room in the stronghold. And then you'll get this sort of effect, where uh, it's not quite like the void, but it definitely has a sort of void feel to it, uh, and it will look even better once we get this section done. His alternative design offers a pleasant ender purple mixed with a modern looking grey and white concrete pattern. All circular and glowy, it sure is much nicer than having a silverfish box lighting the place. Though on the topic of circular and glowy, Grian finally addresses the recent embiggening of the moon. Choosing the mountains of Botum as his stargazing spot, he builds an observatory to track the behaviour of the natural satellite from. The scientific findings Grian documents on the ceiling of the observatory itself, by expanding the ridges of the telescope opening to the proportionate size of the moon that night. On the cusp of being too wide. Oh, whoa. I think the moon's gonna cause a few problems around here. So that is currently the width. If it gets bigger, we should be able to open this up with more glass and mark it out as it goes. Though the speed at which moons are growing is not exactly helpful unless you've got yourself a way to control it. Wise to that, Green invests some time into the Midnight Alley's interiors, which should probably be interiors squared, given that the whole alley is already sort of indoors. True to his word, he establishes a storage in one of the shops, which I guess now counts as a pet shop too, given that it houses a chest monster. I don't know, I, I have a thing of just really enjoying looking for stuff like this way, so this is, this is the future everyone, giant chest monster shop. Now before gravity gets a chance to end the season, it's happy to hurt our hermits otherwise, and so is Cubfan, frankly. The drip leaf spleef leaves the ankles of the server on their tippy toes, though we're not sure who won it because Cub hasn't released a video about it yet. We know Izuma went, and it's a telltale sign that his build for the video is a car. After he sorted out AFK copper conversion, X's preferred method of delivering the oxidized blocks to the server mates turns out to be a semi truck. Though it should be a lumber mill with how hard he is undercutting Tango Tech and Octagon on the product. The prices here are way, way higher than I was expecting they're always sold out, so clearly there's room in the market here. Now how the creeper in the back helps with sales is not entirely clear, I guess it could be that this is a combustion engine. Okay, so we got a creeper caught in this area, it can have my piston, I don't want it back. 
NASA recently sent a probe into space to attempt to divert an asteroid, which might explain why chunks of rock are now falling on Doc M and Rendog's chicken farm. This comes as an interruption to Doc M's other business for the week, which mostly involves getting spleefed and buying a bunch of components from Botum so he can work on his latest redstone project, a piglin bartering farm that ejects all the proceeds into the overworld for easy sorting. Boom, going into the system and what we want to see is it's simply passing by and being burned. Beautiful. But it's in the middle of their latest meeting, while Ren is showing Doc around the new mansion he's built at their gothic wheat field, that a chunk of moon rock neatly demolishes the roof of their hen coop. Today we've never got a bridge over this river. I've been threatening no. to make a bridge since the first episode, but um... Yeah, I, I thought this was Whoa! Look what at that! What have you done? Nothing! Doc, what have, I, know, I know you always hated this farm, but what have you done? Oh my goodness, look at the damage, the whole... The thing is destroyed. They place it in the center of the auditorium, at which point it starts making eerie Morse code sequences and they decide to leave it alone before it tries to make friends with them. In Ren's case, this means going back to the terraforming project on Octagon Island, which is slowly transforming into a dead coral reef populated with amethyst crystals, sea pickles, and glow lichen, which might be the one thing which can fix Diorite's image problem. And I gotta say, my favorite feature of this landscape, definitely these calcite growths over here, right, that we've been making out of this block. I actually don't even know what that block is called. In between the satisfying time lapses, we also see Ren's point of view on the goating of Botum, some notable earthquakes, and helping Doc test the super fast gold farm, which mainly involves standing back and watching the piglins rain down on you like angry confetti. Okay, that is absolute insanity. I mean, this thing is going to make more piglin bits than a server will ever need in like a hundred years. Well, that oh. literally got my heart racing, Doc, so that's that's one way to wake up in the morning. Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> Impulse SV's mob farms are a little less intentional, but almost as productive. Uh, this may be part of the lag in Bodum. I have a mob farm in the cooling towers. Oh my gosh, there's so many mobs. I need to go get some torches. A bit of lighting later, he has a plan for the insides of his factory chimneys and using iJevin's shulker farm to steal fizzy lifting mobs, he rigs up the chimney to levitate him when he's within range. And no shulker farms were harmed in the making of this video. Oh, here we go. Okay, that went the wrong way. Shulkers aren't the only thing popping up in the factory, as Impulse spots something a little sus in his factory tower, and it turns out there are a few others amongst the Botum Crew's bases. I mean, it's yellow, so that's totally fitting. ...game before, so I don't really know what this thing is called, but I would like to know where it came from, because literally no clue. It's a little less sinister than the giant floating eyeball B-dubs built over Botum Town, most of which we heard about last week, but it's good to get another pair of eyes on it, as he helps Tango test the wireless redstone and observes the squadron of Ravagers being warped into position. Oh! <laughs> oh! Two! Only two! There's three! Four! Tango, it's so many I can't... <laughs> I can hardly hear. It's a courtesy they extend to visitors at the Big Eyes town too, as B-dubs relocates their main nether portal to a scenic pontoon shack, surrounded by a few other floating structures. Their main visitor will still probably be Etho once he decides he's in need of ladders. I have names, so we've got the TNT shop, the boat shop, and of course, ready for Etho, one diamond for six stacks of what? You called it! Ladders, where's my trapping bench? And speaking of Etho, the racetrack project he started with B-dubs hasn't been forgotten. It's just that Minecraft's horse breeding mechanics make it just as awkward to make bad horses as it is to make good horses. Perhaps all they need is a scientific mind like ZAFs, although even that may have met its match when he called Mumbo in for testing. After some solid verbal key smashing and two Englishmen having a crisis about English, he said, Words ending in ing. He got it wrong. Adjectives do not end in ing. Those are verbs. <laughs> the worst part is I have, a, I have an A level in English. All right, that's like, that's like a qualification that you get after school and I still forgot. Mumbo returns to Botum to find there are goats moving in with him. So naturally his first step is to drop them into a volcano. <laughs> <laughs> oh! 
Oh my goodness, I've forgotten about that! Despite being a well-documented pacifist, his incidents with animals continue, as he nearly crushes one of the company donkeys in the garage door. But having saved himself from that, spoiler alert, he gets awarded a matching hat from Scar. <laughs> You gave me a wing! Which explains why he was looking so aerodynamic at the Botan meeting last week. And finally, there's Ijevin, and the man grows a mangrove. Okay, it's a willow, but who's counting? These things are really hard to build. This is probably one of the hardest things that I've ever built uh, in survival Minecraft. It, it, was, it was really tough. <laughs> the enormous tree houses the nether portal to his end of the swamp, leading a visitor near to the edge of the pit to the slime void. Or it could be liquid XP for all you know, since Jevid is now mass producing a whole lot of it through the bamboo and kelp farms combined into a few furnaces perpetually smelting sushi roll wrappings. And really what a fitting end for this script, because the videos for this week were quite the experience. Kind of say, Jevin, why don't you use smokers or blast furnaces? It's actually kind of simple. I'm an old Minecraft soul, and I just literally forget that they exist. <laughs> and that's about it for this week's recap. Our writer is Loy XP, and my name is PixelRiffs. Captions on this video were provided by Liara. All of us have our own YouTube channels, and Zloy is back making videos for his one. So it would be a great help if you click the link in the end screen and watch the pre-final episode of his current survival series. It has a few solid jokes, lots of explosions, and a whole bunch of video editing. So all the stuff you like in this show, but with a less British accent. Don't forget to leave a like while you're still here and subscribe so you won't miss future recaps. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week.